Good morning, Crossroads. Uh, <laughs> good morning, Crossroads. Good morning. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's really nice you acknowledging my presence as I acknowledge your presence also here. It's a, it's a joy to be here. My name is Sossi Bene. I'm a member of the teaching team here at Crossroads. And um, it is my pleasure this morning also to continue our series, The Unfolding Story. And as we continue, I just want to say thank you for those of you who have been with us the last, I don't know how many weeks, uh, as you patiently kind of travel with us and read together with us and listen together with us and think and pray and worship together with us in this series. And Yes, you may. Providential. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing this with us and allow me to pray for this uh, moment here with us. Uh, she just shared with us that the last song that we are sang was really meaningful to her because last Friday she had to say goodbye to a dearly beloved as the person passed away of uh, breast cancer. And uh, the last song that we have sang, it meant a lot to her. Uh, thank you, worship team, to leading us. Uh, this is why we are a church. We carry each other's burdens. We laugh with each other. We worship with each other. We cry with each other. And sometimes songs reach there where words fall short. And she would like to sing this song also at the funeral uh, next Friday, and she asked for prayer. So let us bow our hands and pray for our sister and for her family as they are grieving the loss of a friend. Heavenly Father, we have words deep within us that are buried, and sometimes we do not have words for, but music, rhythm, sound, and songs bring it out before you father we lay bare our grief before you and um, we pray that you draw near to this grieving family who have lost a beloved one father we pray for rest and peace we pray that uh, your healing hands and your your graceful hands might reach out and reach deep and comfort those who are mourning today. Father, yet we are not hopeless in face of death. We know that one day, when you make everything right, we can look forward to the resurrection that you showed us in Jesus. For those who have went before us, when we go and when others will go as well, that one day we will be with you. We'll have what you have, and we will be in the place where you are. And that's our deep hope today, our Father. As we continue to worship in listening to your word, as we continue to quiet our souls before you, Father, we pray that you give us eyes to see and, ear, and ears to hear, and hearts and minds to receive your words, your spirit, your comfort into our lives. Father, we worship you and we love you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So thank you all for being here and going with us and coming with us on this journey of, um, of the story of God, which unfolds in the scriptures. And it unfolds in such a way that 
it brings us along in this story. The story of God is also our own story. Being caught up in that story of God's creation, man's rejecting God and God coming after man time and time again, calling people to be agents of his love, of his hope, of his blessing in this world. And last week we have heard and we have seen how God has called one family, the family of Abraham, and blessed them in order for them to be a blessing to all the nations in the world. And we see how today we're going to be seeing how this one family becomes a nation and what God does with this nation. And in that we will be hearing and listening to this next chapter in the unfolding story of God. And the invitation of, of this sermon series is to recognize how our own lives, our own life stories are caught up in this story of God. That it has something to do also with us as well. And that's, that's what we're going to be listening to today. We're going to be mainly focusing on the book of Exodus. We're going to be taking some big steps in it. That's the second book, by the way, in the Bible. We are taking our time with the story of God. And our ultimate aim is to finally arrive on Christmas evening to God with us. Of God's incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's the long hope that we have in this, uh, in this series. So today, I would like to talk about three things. First, we're going to be looking at work and worship and how the two are related to each other. Then we're going to be looking at freedom and idolatry. And finally, we're going to be hearing and beholding, to a certain degree, the glory of, of God. I'm going to be reading from um, Exodus 5, the first couple of verses. Now, what is happening in Exodus has to do with everything that has happened so far in the book of Genesis. Abraham was called to be a blessing to all nations. Abraham gets a son, Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. God calls Jacob to continue the blessing that he has given to his grandfather. And Jacob has then 12 sons. And the 12 sons are the one, the recipients of the blessing of God for them to continue the project of, of blessing all the nations. We know the story of Joseph. Joseph gets to Egypt because of hunger. The whole family moves to Egypt. 400 years pass by. The family becomes a nation. I'm going very fast right now. <laughs> I hope you bear with me. But as a family grows to become a nation, then they become also a problem. And something of that we know as well. Whenever a minority that doesn't speak like us, doesn't look like us, becomes too big to handle, it becomes a problem. And the Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh, thinks of two, so of, of two solutions to deal with the problem that this nation presents. And one is to make them work even harder than they have been working. And then there is the evil and maybe even more evil, treacherous uh, uh, solution. And that's to commit infanticide. Now, if you don't know what infanticide is, the decree of the Pharaoh was to kill every child, male child that is born to the Hebrews. Now, under these conditions, there's nothing much left but to cry and to cry out to God. And the people of God cry out to God, and he calls, finally, Moses. He calls Moses, who escaped the infanticide, who was raised in the court, who became a re revolutionary, who became a murderer, and then becomes a shepherd. And at the age of around 70, again, I'm coming back to this theme, old people matter in the story of God. <laughs> Sorry, he was 80, so even older than 70. That's when really life is starting in the story of God and calls Moses to come and to do something about the God's peoples and their suffering. So here's an episode, now that we are caught up in the story, this is an episode of Moses going and doing something about this. Afterwards, 
Moses and Aaron went to the Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now, by the way, in Egypt, the Pharaoh was God. Anybody suggesting that there is a God beyond the Pharaoh, it was lunacy. You would not do that to a Pharaoh. Anyway, Moses is doing it. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews, he has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, the Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Slavery and work. We know something of slavery and of especially a slaved work. We have heard about sweatshops. We have heard about sex trafficking. We have heard about cobalt mining. We have heard about historically and even present about slavery and work. And we know something of a different kind of slavery, which I call that a voluntary slavery. And that voluntary slavery is something that we are maybe even more intimately knowing than, than these kind of ancient forms of slavery, or even present day slavery. And that's the voluntary slavery. Just give me a salary, four weeks of holidays, and a stable life, and I'll do everything in my power to behave. And if I cannot do everything, then we will organize a couple of coaches and a couple of consultants, and I'm going to behave. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to offer up everything in my life just to have the salary and the four week off, as long as my life is guaranteed and stable. Or maybe the next sentence will give me a lot of trouble, but here we are. In our secular world, work has lost its meaning. In the secular world that we live in, our work has lost its meaning. You see, we use work for maybe two things. First, to kind of build our identity. Right? My work is who I am. If I go to a party and I introduce myself, I'm not saying that I hail from my parents and this is where I come from. No, the first thing we say is my work. It's fully my identity. It's who I have become. And God forbid if I do not have work. Because the party becomes really, really difficult to be at. Second, we use work to maintain our life and especially our lifestyle. We have accustomed to a certain kind of lifestyle and works makes it all possible. Now, Crossroads, is this enough to work? Is this enough to keep us busy and working? To get identity and to get a certain kind of lifestyle? Is work enough for all of that? 
And God forbid if somebody starts asking about the meaning of their work. Why is it that I'm doing what I'm doing? What does it all mean in the bigger framework of everything that is happening in the world? God forbid that people have enough time off to actually start thinking about the meaning of their everyday work. And then there's also the unseen workers of our world. You know, sometimes I drive to my own work at 6 o'clock in the morning. And as I drive to The Hague, we live in a smaller neighborhood. And as I, as I drive to The Hague, I see in the morning at 6 o'clock the Polish guest workers standing on the street corner waiting for the Polish cars to come and pick them up and bring them somewhere to work. Or if I don't go by car and I take my tram and I get under the, the tram, I see exactly the same people as I'm seeing every time I take the tram at 6 o'clock in the morning. These are the people who usually work in service jobs. These are the unseen workforce that we usually do not really encounter and oftentimes we do not even have them in our social circles or in our churches. You know, if you are a doctor, do you really know the person's name who cleans the hospital? If you work in an office, do you really know the name of the person serving you coffee? Do you see them at all? Do they matter at all? And these are the kind of people who have nothing left but to cry out to God. These are the kind of people who cry out to God and say, God, do something about our faith. And God sends Moses and Aaron to go and do something on behalf of these particular people, of these kind of workers. You see, because human beings were not created only to work. God created human beings to worship. To worship Him first and foremost. You see, when you decouple work from worship, then work for its own sake, it becomes a very terrible proposition. It becomes a race of those who have and those who have not. Then we come up with slogans like, hard work pays. But the outcome of that sentence, of that motto, is very different in people's lives. You know, if you work in a bank and you work hard, you finish very different than somebody who cuts chicken into pieces for a life. Both of them are working really hard. But one of them can go four times a year on holiday and the other one barely can afford to take time off. Yet we believe that hard work pays. You see, when we decouple work from worship, we don't know anymore why it is that we are working. And just working for ourselves or for our lifestyle is just simply not enough. But when you couple work to worship, then your work might become meaningful. Because it's not about work anymore. It is about God. It is about living for God. Fulfilling our deepest identity. Of being worshippers. Rather than merely workers. And this is what is contested between Moses and the Pharaoh. To whom do the people belong? Do they belong to the Pharaoh? For him and for his megalomaniac building project? Or do people belong to God? And that's what is in front of us right now. That's what is facing us. That's how this passage of scripture also reads our own lives. To whom do we belong? Do we belong to the structures of works that we are spending 40 hours, 60, 60, 70 hours a week to work? 
to whom do you belong? Do you belong to that or do you belong to God? You know, we meet every Sunday morning here just to remind you, just to remind myself as well, that I am not my work, I am not my job. I am more than that. That's why we sing, that's why we cry, that's why we pray, that's why we listen. Because we were made for more. We were made for God. And then God just does that. As he calls Moses to come and with the agency of Moses, he frees his people out of Egyptian uh, slavery. He brings them into the desert. They escape the confines of being slaves. And what happens to these people? What happens to the people of God whom God saves? You know, when you have been slaves for about two to three hundred years, slavery becomes internalized. The only freedom they can imagine for themselves is very striking. And this is what we read. Continuing to read. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods, who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, he won't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. They said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. People who have been beaten down all their lives. The only thing they can imagine. The only freedom they can imagine. Is the freedom to worship that which is most precious to them. God is invisible. God is speaking to Moses and he is giving laws to Moses. Because people don't know how to worship God. So God gives the law. God tells them, this is how you organize your society. This is how you celebrate. This is how we relate to each other. That's the conversation that is taking place between God and Moses. And that conversation is on a mountain and it's taking too long. And the people look around and they, they still remember the freedom. They still remember the escape out of Egypt. But people who have been slaves, the only freedom they can imagine is the freedoms that they knew when they were back in Egypt in slavery. The only gods, the only idols that really matter are the ones that are visible. The ones that are shining like gold. That's the only thing they can imagine in their heads. And they ask Aaron to do just that. Create for us a God that we can worship, that we can see. Like the gods we had in Egypt. Because this other god is... Where is he? He's invisible. What is God to do with people like this? These are the people he has saved for out of Egypt. These are the people he has shown that it's possible to escape slavery. That it's possible to move from hard work to worship. And yet the natural tendency of the people of God is to reject God. And to worship that which is visible, that which is precious to them. What is God to do with these kind of people? And in the third act of Exodus, God says, you know, I'm going to reject these people. And Moses, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to make you into a great nation and... Our future together, me and you, is secure. Let's go do that. 
And something amazing happens in the Bible. Something really amazing happens in the Bible. Moses goes to God and says, you know, these people you have saved out of Egypt, they don't belong to Pharaoh anymore. You have defeated Pharaoh. They belong to you. These are your people. What will everybody think if you leave them here to die? Without you, we cannot have any future. And God changes his mind. God changes his mind. And he says to Moses, okay, then I'm going to go with you. I'm going to attach myself, God, the almighty God, to people who do not want me. I'm going to be their God. I'm going to be the God of people who have rather worship a golden calf than worship me. I'm going to be the God of people who would rather follow their own minds and own standards. And I'm going to be their God. You see, oftentimes people say that there's such a big difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. That somehow God in the Old Testament is all angry and the New Testament he's become this really nice and poppy God. If you read the Old Testament carefully, you will see that God is always on the losing end. God is God everywhere but in the hearts of his own people. That is the kind of God he wants to be. And then Moses says to God, you know God, I would really love to see your glory. I would love to see the fullness of who you are. Let us read it. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked me because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. God wants to start over. God wants to start over with Moses, but for Moses this is not enough. God needs to go with his people. It is his people after all. This is the place where God decides to have a relationship with these particular people. 
with these kind of people. This is what it ultimately means to be the people of God. We are worshipping a God who is willing to be the God of those who have even rejected Him. This is the kind of relationship He wants to have. This is one of those amazing turns in the story of God. And then when the day comes and God passes by, this is what he says. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. And what is really striking, and when God says who he is, what we see is the abundant, the abundance of his love mercy and grace to the thousands of generations and in being loving and merciful and gracious he is also at the same time just it's interesting that he's loving and caring to thousands of generations but just for the second or the third generation it means that his love mercy and care outweighs his justice. This is the God that calls us to worship. This is the God that calls us away from our work to worship him. And as we worship, we learn what it means to be human. And as we worship, we learn what it means to work, really work. Maybe there that we discover what work really means. Maybe in worshiping God, we truly discover the meaning of our everyday work. The glory of God in the story of Moses is the passing glory. is the glory that no one can behold and live. But there comes a time in the scriptures, and we see that, that there was a person, Jesus, who being equal with God, did not consider equality of, with, with God to be something to be grasped, something to hold on to. But he became a human being. Now what is the kind of human being that Jesus becomes? And the Bible says they use this very interesting word. He becomes even a doulos. That's a Greek word for slave. When the glory of God became incarnate, incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, it became a slave. He identified with the workers who did not own their own business. He identified with the unseen workers of this world. He has come to them to save them and to show them what it means to worship. 
that was the moment in history when that kind of work became dignified work. Crossroads, this is, I think, our calling today. This is what God is calling us to. The gracious, the merciful God calling us to himself to worship. Away from our idols, away from our work, away from our money, away from everything that we think is important, to come into his presence and to worship and to find life, true life. Let me pray for us. Worship him. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have saved us uh, from ourselves. You have saved us from slavery, from anything that enslaves us. And you have called us to yourself to worship. So teach us, Father, how to worship, how to live a life consecrated to you. Father, in our pursuit of freedom, the best thing we can come up with is idolatry. Save us from our, save us from our idols so that we can be truly free to, again, worship you. And Heavenly Father, as we behold your glory in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, receive the worship that we have for you. We pray this not in our name, but in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.